from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Romain Grafalda. I don't know how many uh, staffers we have here and how many outsiders, so uh, permit me to introduce myself. Um, I head the Library of Congress Asian American Association. This is one of our uh, first uh, programs. I'm told that uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Lum, has been here before. Have you? Yes, has he has been here before about, I think about six years before I was even alive in the Library of Congress. So I welcome him thoroughly. Um, I welcome all of you for coming today. Uh, I guess it's too early for lunch, and when you leave, lunch is almost halfway uh, at the cafeteria. So without further ado, may I introduce the Vice President of the LCAAA, who will introduce Dr. Lum. Tomoko? Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Tomoko Steen. I'm a research specialist at Science, Technology, and Business Division. This is a co-sponsored event of the LCAAA Asian American Association and uh, Library, Science and Technology, and Business Division. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome back the uh, Professor Lam. Uh, he came for the our Asian Pacific uh, Heritage Month uh, seven years ago. And uh, this, this is the second time, but the huge data accumulated over the time. <laughs> and, uh, well, I hope you can enjoy that, you know, the, all the stories he is going to tell us. Um, Professor Lam did a bachelor's degree at Berkeley. And uh, at that time, uh, the so many leading molecular evolutionists were there, and he studied under them. And then he did a PhD at the University of Hawaii under um, Rebecca Kahn, who is the, you must, some of you might know about the mitochondrial Eve. She's uh, well known for that scientist, science work. And um, he is um, professor at uh, Biganton currently, SUNY Biganton. And uh, he's an uh, anthropologist, molecular anthropologist, so study anthropology in the molecular level. And, uh, but he covers many different subjects, including ancient DNA. So we will have a, a lot of interesting stories here. So um, without further ado, please welcome with me uh, the Professor Lam. Uh. Thank you, Tomoko, for inviting me back here again. Um, is this okay? Can you hear me? Okay, so um, I'm going to be telling you a, a, a lot of little things that fit together. It's all about the Pacific. It's a, a kind of an overview of the things I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, I started uh, looking at, at, at Pacific migration as a graduate student back in 1989 in University of Hawaii. And since then, I've, I've kind of expanded from just looking at how people got to uh, different islands in the Pacific to uh, uh, looking at, at malaria and infectious disease in the Pacific, and then uh, looking at commensal organisms, how different things got out there, how mosquitoes got out there that then transmitted the malaria. And then more recently, I've been looking at and focusing on modernization and how uh, changing cultures change the health of people in different areas. Um, and then most recently, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get into some work on the microbiome, and, and I'll close with that. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a whirlwind tour of some of the things I've been doing um, with, with my graduate students and, and other students uh, from Binghamton University. Um, and uh, I guess I'll start by telling you a little bit about the, what my laboratory does. My laboratory is the Laboratory of Evolutionary Anthropology and Health, and the basic idea is that uh, humans evolved in Africa, and then over the last 80,000 years or so, um, spread out all over the world. And from one population that was in one place, they're now just, we're now distributed all over the world. And over the, that period of time, we've adapted in different ways to those different environments. Um, in the middle of the, the, the slide, you can see, um, for example, skin color and how skin color has changed and we now have, have uh, different arrays of skin colors, but we also have different body types, and a lot of these have environmental uh, influences. Why are some people dark? Why are some people tall and skinny? Why are some people more round? And a lot of this has to do with environmental selection and, and uh, different processes. Um, this 
map I'm showing you over in the middle of the slide is looking at uh, BMI, um, your, the ratio, how, how kind of round you are versus how tall you are, and how that changes as you move away from the equator north and south. And this has to do with heat conservation. But in the same way our bodies and our skin color has changed, so has our immune function. As we've gone to different environments, we're, we're influenced by different types of diseases, and those diseases influence our immune systems differentially. And we've also um, um, had different ways to sustain ourselves. We have different types of, of, uh, of food gathering and food production. Different populations evolved uh, agriculture in their societies. And different populations were still hunter-gatherers until very recently. So our bodies have responded not only to climates and environments, but diseases and also diets. And, and that's, that's part of the story, but the, the recent story is all about modernization and how in the last 500 years all of these diverse populations that got very different, started as, as a, a uniform population, moved all over the world, got very different in very m many different ways, are now increasingly coming together. And we're finding ourselves, people from all over the world, with different susceptibilities to diseases, different propensities for, for succeeding in different environments, and different uh, cultural adaptations are increasingly finding themselves together and bringing all of those things together. Beliefs, behaviors, cultures, diseases, diets, all coming together, especially in, in our modern cities, um, like Washington, D.C. But the other thing that's happening in modernization is that we're living in larger groups than we ever lived in before. And so that our, our, the very societies and the way that our societies work are also changing. Um, if, if you're off on a small island like, like I, I was a month ago, and you walk around and you see someone, the first thing you do is you try to figure out how you're related to that person or who you know. You don't do that in Washington, D.C. or New York City. There are just too many people. You can't know everyone that you run into. The Dunbar number, the, the number of, of humans that we can actually know, has been estimated to be something like 150 or 200. And you bump into more than that on your way to work. So we can't physically, intellectually, emotionally know all the people that we see, regardless of how many Facebook friends you have. <laughs> so part of the, the modernization is changing the way that our societies work, changing the way that we have access to foods, or you know, I have TV dinners down here with things that we call foods <laughs> that may or may not be good for us, um, and also these diseases. I have some condoms here to show, uh, to, to infer AIDS and HIV and different diseases. It could be SARS, any of these things that, that are, are pa uh, pandemics that are moving around. So we started off as a, a uniform population. We uh, move all over the world. We adapt to all these different places, become very different in very different ways and now we're all coming back together. And these, I think, are, are kind of the scenarios that are important right now for human health. Um, specifically, most of the research that I, I do is, is focused on the Pacific. Um, how people settled the, the various islands of the Pacific, how they then became adapted to those local environments. Um, often this meant that, that as you move farther and farther out into the Pacific, there is less and less raw materials already there. So to succeed, you have to bring your own plants and animals with you. As you move out farther and farther, though, you start avoiding some of these different diseases that, that are, are common in the tropics. So your whole disease profile changes, your food profile changes. Um, so you have to bring things with you. One of the things that, that you bring with you are things like pigs. Um, inadvertently out to Vanuatu, which I'll be talking to you about um, in, at length during this talk. The Anopheles mosquito also came, and this is the, the, the vector for malaria. Um, uh, malaria then sets up these gradients of selection on different environments that then affect the humans. Secondarily, more recently, uh, we've uh, developed different kinds of medicines to combat malaria. Uh, the parasites have, have secondarily become re immune or resistant to these different medicines in different ways in different places. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then I'll, I'll close by talking about modernization and the effects of chronic disease. I show a little cruise boat here. One of the islands that I work on in Vanuatu, in Naicham, uh, where my colleague Akira Kaneko eradicated malaria in 1991, they've been having an increasing number of cruise boats. Um, they just signed an, a contract with Royal Caribbean. Next year, they're going to have 70 cruise boats. This year, they had about 50. So they're already getting about one a week. They're going to get more than that now. This is an uh, island with a population of about 800 residents. These cruise boats dump 1,500, 2,000 tourists out a day. And this is, is, is a, a good source of, of hard currency, but it is also changing their cultures. It's changing what they do 
in terms of their daily activities, what they eat, and what resources they have, and that's having an effect on their, their health. All right, so that's kind of an overview of what I'll be talking about within this context of, of um, dispersal and, and uh, diversification and modernization. All right, so I'll give you, I'll start by giving you an overview of how people got to the Pacific. Um, the earliest people reach uh, the things that we call the Pacific Islands, uh, New Guinea up here and, and Solomon Islands, Bismarck's, uh, about 40 to 60,000 years ago. At that time, uh, in the Pleistocene, um, the sea levels were a lot lower, so you could walk out from Asia all the way out almost to Borneo um, and, and look across at Sulawesi. Uh, meanwhile, New Guinea was attached to Australia, which was a attached to Tasmania. So you have these, these super continents at that time. This Sunda Peninsula was, was uh, larger than the Indian subcontinent. Um, this is now broken up into what is now Indonesia and the Philippines. All right, so people get over there when, when the, the, the voyaging distances across, the, uh, the seas were a lot smaller, but it's still a major biogeographical barrier, uh, Wallachia. So you have placental mammals mainly in Asia, and then you have uh, marsupial mammals mainly in Australia, New Guinea area. Um, so you get a, a drop off of, of biodiversity and changes there. Um, so humans are getting uh, out to New Guinea and Australia uh, back in the Pleistocene. And then there's this recent expansion off into remote Oceania fairly recently, within the last 3,000, 3,500 years. Uh, another group of people um, settled all of these, these very remote islands. So there's two major waves of these uh, human settlement of the Pacific. Um, and this is, this is very easy to tell archaeologically because the second group of people, um, we refer to them as the Lapita cultural complex or the Lapita people, they made this amazingly intricate pottery um, and it's, it's identical uh, in, in its forms, not just its, its form but its decorations across large distances within a few hundred years. So it's very clear that this is one group of people uh, traveling these distances. They also had a number of, of uh, animals of Asian origin, the pig, the dog, the chicken, the rat, and inadvertently the Anopheles mosquito that they bring with them. Um, so these are the, the big things that you find throughout the Pacific and Polynesia everywhere, and these are of Asian origin. They also brought a number of different tree crops and things that were domesticated in, in New Guinea and Solomons. Um, and we can also look at the languages of, of people that are, that are currently within the Pacific, and you see that, that all of these people that are associated with the, the, the Holocene, the recent expansion, speak a very closely related uh, group of languages, Austronesian languages, that are related to languages in Taiwan, and interestingly, all the way out to Madagascar. So before the European expansion, uh, the Austronesian language family was the most uh, dispersed language uh, family in the world, over halfway around the world. Um, particularly on islands in the Pacific, because these are also the people that invented the outrigger canoe um, and also starlight navigation. And so I don't know if anybody's a sailing fan. I just came from San Francisco the other day, and I was watching some of the America's Cup, and they have these new uh, winged uh, boats, but they're still catamarans. So $500 million of design later, these boats still look like Polynesian double-hulled canoes. Um, so there's still not a better boat out there than the ones that these guys were using to get all the way from Easter Island um, and on to Madagascar on the other side of the dispersal. Um, some of my early work, my dissertation work, was looking at mitochondrial DNA, these maternal lineages, and looking at, at what maternal lineages were on different islands and trying to infer where people came from. One of the things that uh, I, I discovered was that um, of the... Uh, the two groups, the possible source populations, Southeast Asia and, and Australia and New Guinea are very different. They have mutually exclusive groups of, of mitochondrial lineages represented by these colors. Um, the people in Polynesia are predominantly Southeast Asian in their origin of their lineages, um, but they do have about 5 to 10 percent of lineages that look like they came from New Guinea on the way. Um, you have these islands in Micronesia, particularly in Western Micronesia. Here I'm showing you the Marianas, which look like they were settled directly from Southeast Asia. Whereas you have these, these islands like Vanuatu, where the languages are very similar to the languages in Polynesia. They're settled at the same time as Tonga and, and Samoa and Fiji, and yet most of their maternal lineages look like they came from New Guinea. And I've argued in, in a number of publications that I think this is post-settlement gene flow, and there's a lot of people moving back and forth, and this is one reason why the Anopheles mosquito makes it out there, and Vanuatu is the last malarious island uh, archipelago in, in the Pacific. 
So in some ways, there's a, a correlation between language and genetics um, and biology. And in other areas, there's a, a discontinuity there, and the patterns don't quite mix, which, which says that there's something interesting going on there in, the, in prehistory. And Vanuatu is one of these places. Um, the languages don't match the genetics, per se. Um, we also did some studies where we looked at uh, uh, genetic diversity. As you move out from the presumed source in Southeast Asia and New Guinea, as you move out farther and farther, one thing we notice is that the amount of genetic diversity decreases. And this is, has more recently been shown to be true across the world. If you start in, in uh, Africa and you move outward, you see a decrease in genetic <coughs> diversity. This has also been shown uh, in terms of languages. Uh, not words per se, but if you look at the number of sounds in a language, the South African languages, the, the click languages, have the most sounds per language. And as you move away from that, uh, you get less and less consonants in your language. And you see the same pattern in, in the Pacific, where if you look just at Austronesian languages, these very closely related languages associated with the second diaspora, as you move from, let's say, uh, somewhere here in the Western Pacific out to Hawaii, you just lose uh, consonants. Uh, even from Tonga and Samoa in, in, in uh, Western Polynesia to Hawaii, you lose about five or six different consonants. So things get simplified. You lose things easier than you generate diversity, both in languages and genetics. Um, so we showed that, that you, know, you see this decrease in, in genetic diversity as you move out into the Pacific, and if you incorporate different kinds of patterns that we think we know based on archaeology or language, then the correlation between the loss of genetic diversity actually increases. Um, now I'll tell you a little story about the pigs. Um, this was kind of a fun side project that started when we were doing uh, malaria surveys, and we, we, we heard that there were these, these um, very odd uh, pseudo-hermaphroditic pigs out in Vanuatu. Actually, my, my colleague Ralph Garuda came in and said, do you know anything about these pigs? And I said, no. He says, you work in Vanuatu, don't you? And I said, yes. He says, these are really crazy pigs. Why don't you check them out? So the next time I went out there, I did just that. I was out uh, collecting mosquitoes for another study that I'll tell you about shortly, and uh, we started collecting samples from these pseudo-hermaphroditic pigs. So what's the deal with these things? Well, it turns out that pigs are very, very important in the Pacific, partly because you have agriculture, but you don't have food storage. It's the tropics. Most of your carbohydrates are roots, and they don't preserve very well. So you can't get granaries with thousands of lifetimes of food just sitting there. Things rot in the Pacific, especially starchy roots. So the way that you can, you can preserve food or accumulate wealth is through animals. And if you have lots of pigs, then that is lifetimes of wealth. Um, and this is true throughout the Pacific, but it reaches its most uh, uh, important aspect in Vanuatu, where pigs are actually modified biologically for uh, social reasons. And one of the things that they do in the northern islands of Vanuatu is that they will um, remove the upper canines of the pigs. And pigs have indeterminate growth uh, canines, kind of like rats, they gnaw and they constantly sharpen their front teeth. Well, pigs have the same thing with their tusks. So if you remove the upper canines, what happens is the lower ones will do a complete circle in about six to seven years and two circles in about 11 or 12 years. And it, it, they look very beautiful, they're not so good for the pig. Because these things come up and they puncture the cheek and they sometimes, if they do it really straight, they actually puncture the jaw coming back down. These pigs are, are not happy and you have to kind of hand feed them. They're hard to raise. But if you're in Vanuatu, northern Vanuatu, and you can grow these pigs with the tusks, then you can trade them to your friends who want to take chiefly ranks and they can kill them ritually and take chiefly ranks. So tuskers are very important. The curled pig's tusks, these modified uh, uh, tuskers, are very important. They're so important that when Vanuatu got its independence, they put the tusk on the flag. Um, it's also on the national beer, tusker. There's two national beers that, that are tusker. One is from Kenya, and that's an elephant tusk. The other one is in Vanuatu, and it's a pig's tusk. All right, so here's some examples. This is a wedding where they're killing a bunch of pigs here. Um, uh, here's uh, the pig jaws in, in uh, Jimmy Stevens. Um, he, he led a failed coup after independence, tried to take the northern islands and, and separate and have them still remain under French control. That's a different story. If you want to hear about that, I can tell you about that. Um, but uh, uh, pigs are very important. This is a pig-killing club from Ambrim. Now, if you want to take the highest ranks, though, in northern Vanuatu, you not only have to kill a bunch of pigs and a bunch of tusker pigs, but you have to kill narave. And narave are these special 
pseudohermaphroditic pigs. These are pigs that have um, a, as yet undescribed uh, genetic mutation that results in them not having differentiation of their, their external sexual genitalia. So these are, are male pigs, chromosomally male pigs without a penis and uh, without external testes. Well, sometimes they'll have one, sometimes they don't have any, sometimes they'll be inside of their body. So they produce testosterone, but they have nothing to do with it. And these are honorary pigs. And you can't castrate them like other tuskers to calm them down because they, their, their, their testes are inside their bodies. So these are really tough to grow and maintain. Uh, they're sterile, they don't have a penis, so they have to be uh, produced through their mothers and sisters, right? Uh, so you have to, you have to uh, get these tusker, pseudohermaphroditic tuskers from your friends if you want to take the highest chiefly ranks. So these are, are still important. And we wanted to take a look at this question in terms of these, these ideas of, of modernization and globalization. Um, globally, in the 1850s or so, European and, and Asian pigs were bred together. To, to build the, the fast-growing pig that is common now, the global uh, uh, domesticated industrial pig. And these pigs have been distributed all over the world. And so one of the questions were, these pigs in Vanuatu, to what extent are they the original pigs that got out into the Pacific, and to what extent are they, uh, have they been interbred with these, these global domestics? So we, we uh, got DNA samples from 16 of these Narave tuskers, these pseudohermaphroditic pigs. Um, we got nine samples from this other interesting pig in Vanuatu. In the southern islands, they have hairless pigs called kapia. And these are also high maintenance because they get sunburned. So you have to baby these pigs. Um, so you have two genetic mutations, two high maintenance pigs used for social reasons. This is the ochre face painting of a chief on this kapia. So these are very important pigs. They're traded for uh, turtles and humans and other uh, high status things and they're used for chiefly purposes. We got a bunch of those guys. We got a bunch of control pigs, pigs just wandering around, pigs that were um, stuck in little bags on airplanes, uh, <laughs> pigs being carried to feasts. We just pulled hair samples off some of these pigs to get controls from the same islands. Um, and then we sequenced their DNA. And what we found is that the Naraves, almost all of the, all of the Naraves and almost all of the controls from the same islands where they keep Naraves are the original Pacific pigs. Whereas the Kapia, these, these hairless pigs, a lot of them, most of them, are, are global domesticates. And when we think about this at the genetic level, this makes sense because kapias are bald pigs. You can breed them with anything and then just select out the bald babies from the litter. Whereas these, these, these narave, you have to breed them from the mothers and the sisters of previous narave. And we're looking at a maternal inherited marker. So the maternal line is passed through. It, everything passes through the maternal line. And so the mitochondrial DNA of, the, of these pigs is maintained. Plus, these things are so valuable, they don't want to interbreed them with, with any other pigs. All right. So that's our little story for the, the uh, Narave. When we look more globally, we found that these Pacific pigs that we were looking at in Vanuatu are very closely related to the Hawaiian and the French Polynesian, the New Guinea ones, and the ones in Indonesia. Interestingly, nobody had seen this, but there was, um, we found this paper and there were some Vietnamese wild boars and one of them also had this sequence. So we think that these guys are coming out of Southeast Asia, maybe not Vietnam, but somewhere in this area. And relatively quickly, they, they change their morphology and get them down to a small size that can fit on a boat and be taken to all these different islands in the Pacific. But the same lineages that we have in Vanuatu are still found in these Vietnamese wild boars here. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears away from these, these, these funky domestic animals and tell you a little bit about the mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Um, what we knew before was that there were, um, there's about um, 12 different cryptic species at the genetic level for the Anopheles punctulatus group. Traditionally, they were, they were known as three different species based on their proboscis morphology, but once people started sequencing their DNA, it turned out that there were about a dozen of these things. Um, uh, there might be a few more now or a few less. This is always slightly changing. But each of these different uh, species had different environmental adaptations. Some live on the coast and are very salt tolerant. Uh, some are living in the mountains. Some are living in different environments. Uh, in Vanuatu, it was reported that there was only one. This kind of makes sense because people have only been in Vanuatu for about 3,000 years, whereas the Solomons in, in New Guinea and Australia, they've been for, you know, since the Pleistocene. So we saw that there was a, a difference in the number of species based on the, the time of human habitation. Uh, but we also knew that Vanuatu was very rugged. There's um, 80 inhabited islands. Some are small, some are big. So we went out there just to see 
what the, the genetic diversity of these guys looked like, if there was really only one, and, and how they were related. Um, so this was kind of the master's project of one of my students, Dana, and we went out. Uh, this is some of the data we've analyzed. We've still got another couple thousand mosquitoes sitting in my, my lab, undescribed yet. But this is from about a um, thousand mosquitoes from five different islands. And what we see is that um, there's one main lineage that's found on all the islands. This, what, what I'm showing you here on, on this side is, is a network diagram. So each of these are genetic sequences. Each circle is a genetic sequence. The size of the circle represents how many individuals in our data set had that sequence. And the length of the bars, they're all just one mutation away. So what you see is that there's a lot of mosquitoes that are identical, and they're found on all islands. The different colors are the different islands. And then you have a lot of, of island-specific mosquito lineages which suggests that one group of mosquitoes came in, it went to all the islands, and then the, island, the mosquitoes don't move back and forth between the islands, so you, you generate a lot of island-specific lineages. Um, which was interesting for us from a, a malaria control perspective, because that means that, that the, the mosquitoes aren't really moving back and forth, it's the people that we gotta worry about, not the mosquitoes. Um, we do have another lineage, is what we're calling this group two, which, which looks like it, it's a, a bit different and it's only in the north. So the, it looks like there was m one main introduction of Anopheles mosquitoes into Vanuatu and then maybe a second introduction into the northern islands. Uh, when we started looking at the diversity of these mosquitoes and different islands, we get really good correlations with, with island size. So the number of lineages we find per island, the diversity of those lineages are, are pretty well correlated with the size of the island and also the number of languages that the people speak. So the, the same kind of area size uh, uh, parameters are affecting both the, the Anopheles diversity and also the human cultural diversity. Human population size is, is pretty much correlated except for this island Tana where there's a lot of people on one small island, but they don't speak very many uh, languages. Um, that's another story about Tana. All right, um, so then we had, we had data from, from mosquitoes. We had previously looked at uh, data from humans and the malaria parasites themselves. And what we found there was that the malaria parasites only moved around when the human uh, also looked like they moved around, where there was human gene flow, shown here by this connection between the purple lines between Malakula and Pentecost, where humans were going back and forth, the parasite, the malaria parasite, also went back and forth. We added the mosquitoes to that, and what we, we got a, a good correlation too. The, the places where there were shared lineages were also the places where humans were moving back and forth. So what we think is, is the key to this is hu controlling human movement. If you control human movement, you control the movement of mosquitoes, and you control the movement of parasites. Um, the next little bit I'll tell you about is a, a little bit about uh, um, the way that humans have responded to malaria. And this is, uh, I just showed you some work that, that Dana had done for her master's degree. This is some of the work that she did for her PhD, which she just defended in, in the fall. And what she wanted to do is she wanted to look at the ways that different humans on different islands responded to malaria. Um, so she looked at uh, a total of 23 populations, over 1,200 uh, different samples, uh, individuals from those different islands. And she screened a number of different uh, genes we have um, uh, Southeast Asian ovalocytosis, which is a, a, a mutation that helps you resist malaria, but it's not a very good one. Uh, I say it's not a very good one because it, it really distorts the shape of the red blood cell, and to this date, no one has ever been found with two copies of this gene. So, uh, and when you have populations with a high frequency of heterozygotes, you have a higher frequency of stillborn children. So the implication is, is that if you inherit two copies of this gene, then you're not even born. You're, you're stillborn. Um, so this is, is a way to avoid malaria, but not a very good one, a very costly mutation to avoid uh, malaria. We also look at this uh, Gerbich negativity allele, um, and this is also uh, uh, resist malaria. Um, CR1 also re resists malaria. And then we looked at this uh, TNF-alpha promoter. So TNF-alpha is... Um, a part of the, the immune response, and it's a general fever response. So if you have uh, this promoter, it upregulates your ability to cause a fever, but in a malarious environment, it also leads to a higher susceptibility of cerebral malaria. So we had three resistant alleles and one susceptibility allele, and hopefully if all of these things are working the way we think, then we should see different patterns in those, you know, where the uh, susceptibility ones are high, resistance should be low, and vice versa. We have different, different alleles with uh, opposite selections on them. 
And then because, like I told you, the people in the Pacific, especially in Vanuatu, are a composite between these two different gene pools. Part of the, the main group of people are coming in in the Pleistocene, near oceanic people, and then you also have this second movement of people in from Southeast Asia, both malarious environments, but different gene pools that are, are uh, developing over long periods of time. So instead of focusing on, on any of these single uh, locus, uh, or alleles that are single locus, what we did was we, we summed these all together to get what we're calling a malaria resistant genotype score. So for example, as I said, you can only get one of these um, um, SOAs, so you can get a plus one or you're at zero for, for that locus. Uh, Gerbich, there's homozygotes, so you can go from zero to plus one to plus two. Uh, same with CR1, zero, plus one, plus two. TNF alpha, you can be at zero, minus one, minus two. So you can either have go from minus two to a plus seven in terms of your malaria resistance. Uh, or plus five, sorry. Plus five to minus two, a range of seven. And so we get this score that sums up all these different genetic inherited ways that you combat malaria. Um, because the idea is that uh, any population has a certain number of alleles in it, and you can pick and choose, the, the evolution can tweak any of those, and it's not one or the other, it's kind of a composite of those, and that's your, your uh, immune response to these different diseases. We also looked at a number of unlinked STRs just to look at the genome and to see whether or not that has the same pattern. Hopefully it doesn't have the same pattern. If it does, then what we're really looking at is population history and not disease selection. And then we looked at a number of things that are involved with uh, um, Anopheles mosquito habitat quality, what the latitude is, what the altitude is, what the longitude is. As you go up a mountain, it gets colder and drier, so the mosquitoes don't live as well. Um, as you go south away from the equator in the Pacific, it gets colder, it gets drier. So lowlands in the tropics right near the equator have the highest level of malaria. As you move away from that and up mountains, then you get less malaria. So we have gradients of selection and differential gradients. Um, and then, because we're, we're pulling these malaria parasites out of human serum samples, we can actually um, look to see what the frequency of people in each of these populations at the time of sampling <laughs> had malaria. So that's our, our point prevalence of malaria. So we have a, a guesstimate of how much the malaria selection was by just looking at how many people had malaria in that population. And then we also looked at language and, and geographic distances. I'll tell you a little bit about this first part of the data set, which is just on New Guinea. Uh, a few Austronesian populations, the, these people that came later, a lot of these populations that speak uh, Papuan languages that have been there presumably since the Pleistocene across these gradients of, of uh, altitude. What we see for these, these, uh, those, those different genes that I showed you, um, what I'm showing you here on, the, the, um, on this axis is the, the level of malaria, the point prevalence of malaria, and as that increases, the frequency of the resistant allele CR1 increases, um, the frequency of the Gerbich negativity allele increases, the frequency of this TNF alpha, that's a susceptibility one, goes down. So those three work the way we would expect them to. The only one that doesn't respond very well is, is this uh, Southeast Asian ovalocytosis. That's kind of flat. But again, this is the, the, the allele that's not so good. This is the expensive one, the one that you don't really want anyway. And if you only have that, it's fine, but if you have a choice to, to select for any other allele to resist malaria, those are the better ones. So um, it kind of made sense. When we start adding all these things up and summing them up, we get a much better correlation even than the ones we see. So these ones have 0.73, uh, this is uh, uh, 0.88. When we add them together into our, our, uh, um, our malaria resistant genotype score, the correlations come up a little bit. So we think this is a good method. Um, the only other thing I'll, I'll tell you about her data, when we look at all 23 of those populations and we just focus on this malaria-resistant genotype score, what we see is that the people on the coasts and some of these islands on the coast that have a lot of malaria have on average almost two different alleles that resist malaria. And then as we go up these mountains into the highlands of New Guinea or go to these Polynesian outliers where there is no malaria, people often have uh, less than one or almost one susceptible allele. So across these, these gradients of selection within a very region, a small region, we have big differences in the selection on these different alleles. And I, I, this is, is, it will be important in about mm, three or four minutes. So just kind of think about that, highlands and small islands versus coastal uh, malaria selection. Because what I'm gonna tell you next about is um, drug resistance to malaria. And so this is a, an NIH-funded project that I, um, we're just wrapping up, and it was to look at the evolution of chloroquine resistance in malaria parasites 
in uh, the Pacific. The general history of this is that um, after World War II, uh, chloroquine became very important. It was actually discovered by the Germans during World War II, but for some reason it was claimed to be ineffective for malaria. And there is, um, s there is an argument that uh, Himmler controlled all the revenues from these pharmaceutical companies and the scientists just didn't want to give him the rights to this. So they, they lowballed the effectiveness of this drug. In any case, uh, after the war, the U.S. independently discovered it and then the Germans rediscovered it and chloroquine became the most important anti-malarial. But within about a, a, a less than a decade, we started to see um, resistance appear in Southeast Asia and simultaneously in, in South America. Um, and then uh, in the 70s, it uh, appeared in, in the Pacific um, and also in Africa. Now this is kind of interesting because the most malarious uh, areas are actually in Africa. So resistance doesn't appear where there's the most malaria, it actually appears where there's the least malaria. So this is kind of interesting and, and this will tie into my, my story on the Pacific. Um, it wasn't until about uh, a dozen years ago that we actually knew what the molecular basis for this resistance to chloroquine by the parasite was. Um, uh, David Fiddock uh, at Columbia discovered uh, through a series of very elegant experiments, discovered uh, that there is one single amino acid in one gene that has is, 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 is been shown to be correlated, 100% correlated around the world with resistance to chloroquine. So it's one amino acid change. But it's, it's a little bit more complex than that because there's no parasites that have ever been found today that have only that one mutation. All the resistant uh, parasites have a suite of eight to 10 different mutations, including that one. And different regions of the world have different sets of these complex haplotypes. So there was a big debate um, over the last five or six years of how these, these complex suites of mutations evolved. Does that magic K76T appear first, and then you need these helper mutations to, to make that genotype more fit? Or do you get these kind of uh, tolerant mutations and then K76 comes as the kind of the, the linchpin of all of that and ties everything together and pushes that parasite over the edge? So what we wanted to do was to actually look at this process in real time by exploring a series of samples uh, from the Pacific that had been collected in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that span this time of the evolution of drug resistance within the Pacific and just sit there and watch mutations accumulate. So that's what I'll show you now. Um, we, we just published some of this in, in PLOS earlier this year. I'm going to show you decade by decade and region by region. So in the, the lower right of all these, these slides is kind of a color-coded region of where these samples are coming from. We've got some from the, the north coast, we've got some from the highlands, we've got some from the south coast in these early 59-60 period. Um, all of them are susceptible to uh, chloroquine. Um, there's a few mutations out here, but not very many, not very interesting. None of these magic K76T guys appearing yet. These are the same network diagrams, by the way. So each of these different circles is a different uh, DNA sequence, and the size of the circle represents how many individuals in that, that decade have those mutations. 62, 65, same thing. We have samples from now from Vanuatu, from these different coastal highland populations. They're almost all these susceptible guys. These guys right here are probably susceptible too. You see a few amino acid changes, but nothing so interesting. Till we get to the late 60s and early 70s. And then we get all this diversity coming out. We get diversity, we start getting K76T, this magic resistance guy is popping out here. But what I want you to notice on this is almost all of these mutations are yellow. So they're coming out of one population. And it's not like the yellow guys are, are more than a third of the total data, but they're, they're like 90% of all the interesting mutations coming out. And the yellow guys are from these very small islands in Vanuatu. 79, we've got this nice highland population. For this decade, with this, we don't have any from the islands, but we start seeing all these really bizarre, interesting, fully formed, fully resistant genotypes appearing in the highlands of New Guinea, but not in the coast again. Our last sample from the late 70s and early 80s, we have both the, the small islands and the highlands. They all have these resistant guys. Some of them are identical, but these are on opposite sides of the Pacific. In between are the lowlands where we still don't have any resistant parasites. Um, so this is a summary of all the mutations and all the interesting ones, or the vast majority of the interesting ones, I hope you can see, are yellow and red. And so 
uh, as I told you a, a few minutes ago, when we look at the human beings from these same populations, the yellow and the red guys are the guys that have very few uh, inherited resistance to the parasites. They have the, the least functioning immune systems, inherited immune systems, to resist malaria. You and I, if we go to a malarious country, there's three things that, that can help us with malaria. One is our inherited genetics. The other one is what we've developed um, during our lifetime, how many times our immune systems have been exposed to malaria. And the third thing now is pharmaceuticals. So really, the pharmaceuticals are being helped out by our inherited genetics and our experience with, with the disease. What we see is that the guys, the parasites that evolve resistance the earliest are the ones that are in the bodies of the people that had the fewest inherited mutations to help them out. So basically, those are the human bodies that are like the baby pool. They can figure out, they can explore this mutational space and tweak their genes in different ways and still survive because the immune systems of those human beings are weaker. And once they develop this, this complex haplotype, then they can invade into the lowlands where the people that have high inherited resistance uh, live, and they can then invade those areas. And they do this very rapidly. If you go to these areas now, or even five years after our sampling uh, dates in the early 90s, almost every parasite is resistant. But five years before that, there were no resistant parasites in the lowland. They were only in the highlands and small islands. And, and nobody would have known this if they, we didn't have this amazing series of collections that, that predated and, and bounded that time of disease resistance. So when we put the human genetics together with the parasite genetics, we can actually see what the selective uh, uh, forces were that encouraged the evolution of drug resistance in these parasites. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears again and talk a little bit about chronic disease. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my favorite archipelago in the world, Vanuatu. This is the most interesting place, I think, to do research because it has currently about 240,000 people on 60 inhabited islands and they have over 100 indigenous languages. So it's the most culturally, linguistically diverse place on the planet. Um, some of these islands, the larger ones like Santo and Malakula, have over 20 languages on them each. So this is really interesting. Most archipelagos, at some point in prehistory, there's some kind of cultural homogenization. Either initially where only one group of people founded that island or something happens and, and the island is homogenized. Th not this place. There's so many different languages and cultures and uh, throughout uh, prehistory they're trading things, they're in contact with each other, they're trading sculptures, uh, carving forms, poems, sand drawings, the rights to do different things and they're doing this while maintaining cultural diversity. And so in some ways I think this is a really neat model for globalization. How can you be in contact with people without losing your cultural identity and be functional? All right, um, currently about 25% of the, the population is urban, which means you either li live in Port Vila on, on Afate or in Luganville on Santo. Um, but there's, the majority of the people are still uh, uh, rural, and there's big gradients in development. And that's why uh, uh, we're, we're working there. We want to know what happens when you start controlling malaria, and then chronic disease starts coming up with modernization. To give you a feel of, of some of these differences, um, these are the five islands that we worked on last summer. Um, in 2007, we worked on three of these. Um, this last summer, I was on those same three again that are a subset of these. I was on Ambai. Um, Ambai has very little infrastructure. They still have malaria. Um, it's very rural, um, and, and most of it is, is, is very uh, uh, hard to get around. No running water, uh, no electricity except for generators in some small areas. Um, we also have an island, Nuna, which is on the back side of the main island, and it doesn't have uh, very much infrastructure. It still has malaria. In a lot of ways, it's like Ambai, except uh, the U.S. just built this wonderful road, and you can get from the back side of Afate uh, over to uh, the capital of Port Vila in about an hour. And in Port Vila, you're on a power grid. You have Wi-Fi. You have supermarkets. You can buy. Uh, they had a dual French and British colonialism, so you can go into one of these French grocery stores and get... 30 kinds of cheeses and, and five kinds of pate and 50 kinds of wine. You can get anything you want in, in Port Vila. Um, we also work in, on a Nychum. This is an island uh, where my uh, colleague I, I mentioned uh, eradicated malaria in 1991, and they've been getting increasing tourism. They've got this little atoll uh, where they, they make all the, the tourists stay, and they've built this, this complex now that now has like six flush toilets. There's only one flush toilet on the main island, but there's six for the tourists. And there's these big markets where they'll braid the tourist hair, and they'll sell them little knickknacks, or take them out game fishing. 
And so every time the tourist boat comes in, and now next year it's going to be 70, 70 times a year, they drop anchor and they pay the village association $5,000. And then they go off and they, they spend another maybe $5,000 on, on the hair braiding knickknacks, and then they spend another $10,000 on the fishing tours uh, and other things. So every time one of these, these cruise boats come in, they get like $20,000 of hard currency. So this place has been changing really rapidly. Uh, in 2007, there were three generators on the island. 2011, there were 29 generators on the island. This last summer, I was there a month ago, and everybody's switching to solar. Um, and and it, everything is just leaps and bounds. Everybody has cell phones now. They never had cell phones in 2007. Even now, this last summer, little kids, five, six-year-old kids have cell phones. They don't, they, they don't work as cell phones. They work as little iPods or something. They play games on them because their parents, when they get new uh, cell phones, they give their kids their old ones. So these kids are running around playing games and taking pictures. Um, and then we also went to Futuna, this, this Polynesian outlier island. And, and this is interesting because it's just a, a small rock sticking out of the, the ocean. And it's so rugged. Um, that they've never had malaria because they don't have any standing water. The water just kind of runs right down. So this is a population with no infrastructure but no malaria. So these are the kind of the five islands that we've been looking at in terms of modernization. Uh, no infrastructure, malaria, uh, no, infra uh, no direct infrastructure in malaria but access to the main capital, um, increasing tourism, no malaria, uh, no malaria, low infrastructure, and uh, no malaria and lots of infrastructure. This is some preliminary data from last year. What you see, this is the obesity rate. And when you go from no infrastructure and malaria, there's only about 7% um, obesity. Same with Futuna, the rugged one without malaria. You go to the one with increasing tourism, it's up to 14%. You go to the backside of Afate, it's up to 22%. When you go to the town, it's 34%. It's like the US. So the, the rate, even within this small archipelago where there's only 240,000 people, you're seeing the gradients from, from subsistence agriculture and, and very healthy people in terms of chronic disease to situations that are uh, not unlike Australia or Europe or the United States. And when we did a survey, one of my graduate students is really interested in internet addiction, so we wanted to look at technology acquisition and usage. Um, I'll just have you focus on this one line. Um, Ambai has 40, uh, last year, now uh, I haven't looked at the data from this year, but at that time there were 42% of the people, the adults had, had cell phones in Ambai. Futuna there was 21, Anaitum there's 65, Nuna 78, Afate had 81%. So again, this is like the US, 81% of the people have cell phones. The interesting thing, Futuna didn't even have a cell tower last year and 21% of the people had cell phones. <laughs> and they were either using them as iPods or you know, these are the people that were moving back and forth and they spent a lot of time on other islands so they, they had cell phones. But 21% when they don't even have cell towers is a little high. But all of these other things are, are correlated with that. So the more time you spend sitting around on your computer and not going out growing your food, the more time you spend eating store-bought food are correlated with these, these obesity rates. Um, this is just same data except we're splitting it up into males and females, young adults and, and older adults. Uh, this red line right here is uh, overweight, BMI of 25, and y you notice that most of the young men are fairly fit, but the older men, as you get more and more infrastructure, start moving into the, the on average, into the overweight category. And females is, is exaggerated. Um, this, this solid line right here is the obesity rate. Again, younger women are in general more fit than the older women, but by the time you get out to Afate where they have their power grid and everything else, the average woman, older woman, is obese. Mm -hmm. So these are very big differences uh, between men and women. And one thing that we know happens um, with modernization and the increase of chronic disease is a, a reduction of the age of menarche. So if we look over the last 150 years in Europe and America where we have this data, um, Back in 1860, the average woman in, in Europe and America is getting their first period somewhere around 15, 16 years old, and now it's down to 12 and a half. And this happens over 150 years. And part of this has to do with energetics. The, the body has so much energy, it starts telling them that they're, they're, it's time to reproduce. Right? So their bodies are maturing faster than their minds are in the developing world. This is, this is our data from last summer. We asked all the, the, the women in our survey when you had your first period, and this is broken down by age groups. So the oldest women, they had their first period around 15, 16, and then it drops down to around 15, and then the youngest class is down to 13 and a half. So within a few, maybe one generation, we're seeing the changes that happened over 150 years in Europe 
and America happening in Vanuatu due to modernization. They're getting so much energy. And this is, you, you put the cell phones together with the, the, the age of menarche, and this is a big problem because now the teenage pregnancy rate is going up and also the, the rate of sexually transmitted infections is going up because all these young people, and we have a, we have a technology generation gap in this country. Young kids are, are much more um, uh, competent at using these devices than older people, but more so in Vanuatu. A lot of these older people, they're, they're barely literate, whereas the young kids, they, they pick up these cell phones and they're making dates in the bush and not telling their parents where they're going. And, you know, they're forming all these networks with, with maybe some good consequences, but in, in, in what I'm seeing in the sexually transmitted infections, there's also some, a dark side of this. And um, this, is, this is an increasing problem. Um, getting back to this idea that, that the males are somehow uh, showing less uh, chronic disease or obesity than the females, I started thinking about this, and, and I've been working in Vanuatu now for 12 years, and one of the things that I, I know that the males are doing that the females aren't doing is um, drinking the ritual drug kava almost every night. And kava is, um, uh, is a root. You take it out fresh. You clean it up. You grind it up in, in the Northern Islands. You take a piece of coral and you braid it and you, you strain it and you drink it. Um, in the Southern Islands, you actually chew it up and spit it out and then take that and mix it with water and you drink that. And um, what it does is it, it's a, a postsynaptic neuroinhibitor. It makes your body really loose and it's a muscle relaxant. Um, if you drink a lot of it, you lose control of your body and it's very hard to walk, very easy to fall down, but your mind is still kind of lucid. You get sensitive to light and sound, um, but it makes you very calm. And it's probably why Vanuatu has one of the lowest crime rates in the Pacific. <laughs> because most young males are sedated every night of the year. <laughs> and if you sedate all your young males, crime somehow goes down. <laughs> um, so, but the other thing it does is it also is an appetite suppressant. And it's actually marketed, uh, it, well, it's marketed around the world as a, uh, an herbal, um, a herbal Valium uh, relaxant anti-anxiety compound. Um, until there was a, a, a few cases of liver failure a few years ago, and we can go into that later. But, um, but it, it, it uh, kind of suppresses your appetite. It's been marketed in Japan as a diet pill. Um, so when you drink kava, you don't really eat much. So I was thinking, maybe this has something to do with this difference between males and females. So last year we went out and we asked people how many people were drinking kava and how often they're drinking kava. And what we found is, yes, almost all the males, over 70% of the, the males in most islands are drinking kava almost every night, five or six times a week, whereas the females, not so much. One island, Ambai, the, the older women drink a lot of kava. Um, I went back this year and I actually asked them how, many, how much kava they're drinking each time they drink kava, and the women on Ambai are drinking a lot of kava almost every night, just like the guys in most islands. The women in, in Ambai are also the thinnest ones. So there's something about taking an appetite suppressant every night and, and maintaining your weight. And this, this now it can be a, a problem with modernization because the other thing that Vanuatu does as it plugs into the rest of the world is it's part of this Pacific music, reggae, Caribbean reggae culture. And uh, this is uh, uh, Ocean, this uh, son of a missionary from California who grew up in New Guinea and now spends half his time in New Guinea and Hawaii, and he's one of the biggest music stars in, in the Pacific, hanging out with Ziggy Marley. Um, this is a Vanuatu flag. This is a, a reggae band from Vanuatu, and they've replaced uh, the pig's tusk with a marijuana leaf. Um, these are different reggae bands. This is one of my uh, survey assistants with his dog, Ganja, on, on uh, Anaitim. And so we also asked the guys, do you smoke ganja? And on every island, the young men said yes, about 5 to 15. Um, on one island, uh, almost 30% of the guys, young guys on, on Nightshim are, are smoking ganja. So there's, now there's a kind of a switch from kava to ganja. And if you go from an appetite suppressant to something that creates <laughs> munchies, then maybe that protective effect uh, from ganja is going to go down. All right, so the last, uh, from uh, Kava is going to go down. The last thing I wanted to tell you is uh, what I did this summer. Um, we were wondering about how chronic disease is affected by diet, eating fish, eating fruit bats, pigs, <laughs> octopus, lobsters, uh, sharks. Um, as those diets change to a more modern diet, what is happening to your microbiome, this, this one to two liters of bacteria that live in your, your uh, intestines and is fed by all the things that you don't digest? And so what I did was I collected from three of these islands, Ambai, uh, Anaichim, and, and uh, Erekor. 
um, saliva samples and also tooth swabs to take a look at what are the bacteria living in people's mouths and how that is uh, correlated with their diets. We, we took dietary recalls, uh, which we also have from 2007, 2011, and we're going to compare the, the microbiome data to their diet data and their chronic disease diet. And uh, maybe next time I come, I'll have something to tell you about that. And uh, I'll finish by just acknowledging all the people that we've been working with in Vanuatu, um, uh, my graduate students and my, my uh, uh, colleague, Ralph Garudo, and my lab manager, Rita, and all the people in Vanuatu who help us out when we're there, and my colleague, Chuck Weitz from Temple University, and funding from NIH, Winter Grant, and Binghamton University. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, I'll take any questions you might have. Mosquitoes yes. from island to island or from continent to continent. Um, is it the same with the spread of cockroaches? <laughs> hmm. Cockroaches and mosquitoes. Um, is it the eggs that? that I'm. I. I don't think so. I, uh, mosquitoes are, oh, sorry. Uh, the spread of mosquitoes, how is that similar to the spread of cockroaches? Cockroaches have dry eggs that can last for a long time, whereas the mosquitoes, we think what's happening is they're actually being distributed in water. So I found them in the bottoms of canoes, and the one that gets all the way out to Vanuatu is the salt-tolerant one, and this one can live in brackish water and also in seawater and still develop normally. So we think that the prehistoric uh, transmission was in, in boats, um, recently, since World War II, Guam has something like seven introduced mosquito species, probably due to World War II. So the, I think the mosquitoes is more moving around wet things, either moving around like uh, um, uh, live plants, or the other big one is there's a, a trade in used tires, and rain gets in these tires, and they're really good breeding spaces for, for mosquitoes. Um, but most of the Anopheles, they don't do so well in non-fresh running water, so it has to be pretty rapid. So they don't transmit through boats, or they don't, they don't get out to places very easily. And that's why maybe Vanuatu is the last place. It never gets down to New Caledonia. It never gets down to Fiji. Those distances are a little bit longer. Um, to get down to New Caledonia, you have to go through these upraised coral reef islands without much fresh water. But I think it's a, a very different process. But you know, Hawaii now has, has a lot of mosquitoes, and that was historically from I think a Portuguese or a Spanish ship dumped out their water, and they had mosquito larvae in there. So if you were in Hawaii 150 years ago, there were no mosquitoes, and that would have been really nice. <laughs> yep. Um, just a quick question. First, fascinating talk. Thank you. Uh, second, just a point of information. Your slide about uh, diet and the uh, change in age of man. Yep. Back in the ancient days, when I remember taking anthropology courses, um, we used to simply correlate that body fat, in other words, total body, body fat relative to bone and muscle, hmm. and it carried, a, it, it explained a huge variety of factors, why South African Bushmen, uh, uh, natives, hmm. usually age of menarche was like 17, whereas their bond to neighbors is down around 13, hmm. way back, hmm. back in the 60s. Yep. And you could go to things as, as recent as the Olympics and look at all these girls doing these incredible gymnastics. And many of them don't menstruate until they're 20. Right. So it was a nice cut and dried explanation. You introduced another term that I've not heard, energetic. And I'm wondering what is the difference? What has changed since 20 years ago? Just this question. Nothing. It's, it's body fat and energy usage. Oh, sorry. It, yeah. Um, age of menarche and how that affects, uh, how that's correlated with just body fat or exercise. And I, that's what I'm talking about. Just, you know, your energy in versus your energy out. Um, yeah, if you're, you're a female athlete and you have less than, I think, 7% body fat, then you, you stop menstruating. Um, and so I think that's, that's what's driving this, that people start becoming more sedentary. They're, they're not going to their gardens. They're not growing their own food. Uh, they're also going to stores and buying more energy-dense food, so less activity, more energy, um, and so the, the age of menarche is dropping. And so we've, so in our other... Uh, surveys in 2007 and 2011, we also looked at activity, we had looked at diet, we looked at uh, material possessions. Um, so we're, we're trying to look at all those different variables to try to figure out what are the most important ones because uh, chronic disease is the biggest expense for, for our health care in the United States, but Vanuatu doesn't have any money. You know, if, if, they, if they go down that same path, 
then they're in, they're in, in big trouble. So if we can figure out ways to do education and prevention before it, it, it gets worse, then we're ahead of the game. But if we don't, then maybe the game is over because there's, there's already 25% of the population that is in this state. 75% are still okay. Yep. Uh, you mentioned the human bio, which seems to be a hot research topic the last few years. And um, apparently, you know, we've been taught digestion is through the, uh, the bilia and the small intestines, but apparently uh, the uh, a biome that digests materials of ordinary blood is fiber in our large intestines. People are talking about absorption of those. Maybe we need some of that, but uh, tell me something about that, about the, about the, uh, the, human, the, the uh, biome digesting food and to what extent it's absorbed by the human body. Well, I, sorry, so sh the, she's asking about the microbiome and digestion, small versus large intestine, these things that we used to think about as just fiber that were somehow good as a just a physical movement of things through your intestine are now thought to be actually feeding a diverse uh, community of organisms. So uh, I guess the idea is, my idea, uh, my understanding is that you have this ecosystem within you and you're feeding that ecosystem in, in addition to feeding yourself. So if you only eat very easily digestible things um, that you digest, then you're starving off this, this vast array of things that could potentially be inside of your, your intestine. And those are the things that we presumably evolved with. And so if, if you're going around and only feeding yourself and, and being selfish in a way and not feeding these other things, then you're, you're going without half your digestive system. And so uh, they're associated with a lower diversity of these, these organisms are things like irritable bowel syndrome, potentially Crohn's disease. A lot of these autoimmune functions of the intestine are, are, are uh, maybe influenced by a lack of these diverse organisms that we evolved with. And so that's why we're, we're, we have this nice gradient. We already know something about the rates of chronic disease. We already know something, we think, about their diets. Um, and so we'd like to see how the microbiome diversity correlates with those things. The other interesting thing that I, I didn't really mention but I, I touched on is, the other thing is that in the southern parts of the island, these guys are chewing kava and spitting it out and then everybody sits around and drinks that. So you're also sharing your microbiomes with each other as you drink kava. So one of the things that we did as a group um, when we went out there was we, we did our, sampled our microbiome before we left the U.S. Well, two of us left the U.S., two of us left Japan. And then once we got there, we sampled it again. Then we went down to the southern islands and drank kava that people had chewed, and we sampled it again. Then we went to the northern part uh, where they ground kava, and we sampled it again. So what is the effect of kava on the, your microbiome? What is the effect of drinking kava that somebody else has chewed on your microbiome? How long do you, does it take to be in another environment being exposed to these different uh, organisms that are not potentially washed off, you know, these, we're not going to a supermarket where things are, you know, sterilized somehow. These are, you know, things picked off of a, a tree and kind of washed in a river and then you eat them. So you're, you're getting a lot of things from the environment in these different areas. And, and uh, so one aspect of this is traveler's diarrhea. Is traveler's diarrhea just coming into a new place and finding an equilibrium with what around you and what you have? Right? So how quickly can these things kind of change and how flexible are they? Because everybody's born with nothing. And then you get something when you're breastfeeding or your early age. And some of the studies have shown that all breastfeeding babies around the world have the same things in their gut. It's only when they, they start weaning and getting these region-specific diets that the diversity of those things change. But how fast does it change in somebody with an already established microbiome? How resistant is that to change? Do you have to just go to some place and eat local foods, or do you have to um, physically take in someone's saliva by whatever means um, to, to, to change your microbiome. So we, we, we kind of did that as a, a side project. We monitored our own microbiomes as we did these things. Did you take antibiotics or do you want to mention the, 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 the uh, research has got diarrhea? Uh, I, I didn't take any. Like, no. so. If there's no other questions, uh, please join me to thank uh, Professor Lam again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.